Hi, this is Jack from Anatomy Zone, and in this skeletal anatomy tutorial, we're going to take a look at the femur. So, femur comes from the Latin os femoris, which means thigh bone, and it's the longest, strongest, and heaviest bone in our body, accounting for about a quarter of your height, and it's stronger than concrete. It functions to transmit the weight from your hip bone to your tibia, and it also provides anchor points for over a dozen different muscles, allowing us to move our lower limbs. So, superiorly, it articulates with a part of your hip bone called the acetabulum to form the hip joint, and inferiorly, it articulates with the patella to form the patellofemoral joint, and the tibia to form the tibiofemoral joint, or what we would collectively call the knee joint. Anatomically, the femur is divided into three regions, and we're going to discuss these in turn in this tutorial. So the proximal femur, the shaft, and then the distal femur. And then we're going to finish this tutorial by looking at a couple of different angles, um, the angle of inclination and the torsion angle of the femur, which you might come across. So firstly, before that, um, particularly if you do cadaveric anatomy, you'll want to know how to orientate yourself to a femur, um, so which side it is. Um, this is really easy to do, and all you do is you look at this line here, which is on the back of the femur, and that's called the linea aspera. If you then obviously rotate the femur around, you can tell which side it is. So if the linea aspera is on the back, uh, this femur will be a right-sided femur, because the head of the femur obviously always points towards the joint. Um, so let's just now look at some of the proximal features of the femur. So the first thing to notice is the head of the femur, and then next to it, that we then have the neck of the femur. So just to give a little bit more to this, the only important point of the head of the femur is the fovea capitis. Now that's this central depression that you can see in the center of this femur. Um, now this has an important role in blood supply in childhood. So when you were a child, the head and the neck of the femur are separated by the cartilage of the epiphyseal line, which is your growth plate. So you need two blood supplies. You need one that goes to the neck of the femur, and you need another that goes to the head of the femur, because the cartilage in the middle is, as all cartilage is, is avascular, so it doesn't have blood vessels running through it. So we have arteries that supply the head of the femur come through the ligamentum teres via a branch of the obturator artery, and the neck of the femur is supplied by the circumflex arteries that come off the femoral artery. Um, when you reach adulthood, and obviously your growth plates fuse together, and there's no more cartilage there, the artery that comes through the ligamentum teres actually obliterates, and now in adulthood, all of your blood supply that goes to the neck and the head of the femur is supplied by the circumflex arteries that wrap around the base of the neck. Um, and that has some important clinical consequences um, if you were to have a fractured neck of femur. The next thing to notice are these two bumps here, which is the greater and lesser trochanter. And then between these two, you have effectively two lines. So on the front, it's called the intratrochanteric line. And then on the back, uh, confusingly, it's then called the intratrochanteric crest because it looks more like a crest than a line. Um, and finally, the only other thing which isn't really shown very well at all on this model is the quadrate tubercle. Um, so two thirds of the way up the trochanteric crest, um, there is this small bump. And that's for the quadratus femoris, which is just a small lateral rotator of your hip. Um, so that's the only real things that you want to notice on the proximal aspect of the femur. So now let's take a look at the shaft of the femur. And the first thing to notice is the slight medial direction of the femoral shaft. Now, it, basically, the, the femoral shaft moves towards the knee because it helps to bring your lower limb closer closer to the center of your body, and that helps to improve your stability. And there are a few structures to recognize on the shaft of the femur, but they're quite easy to remember because you, they're sort of linked together and you go from the top to the bottom. So the first thing to notice here is the pectineal line, and, and that's for the pectineus muscle. Um, the next thing next to that is the gluteal tuberosity, and that's the attachment point for the gluteus maximus muscle. So these two bits converge to form the linear aspera, which we saw earlier on, which is that ridge that runs down the posterior aspect of the femur, and it's the attachment site, or one of the attachment sites for the hamstring muscles. And then if we move distally on the shaft, um, the linear aspera actually widens out to form the floor of the popliteal fossa, which is where a small muscle called popliteus lives, um, and that muscle's um, heavily involved in the locking and unlocking mechanism of your knee. So finally, the linear aspera widens out to form these two ridges, called the medial and lateral supracondylar ridges. And the medial one stops at this bump, which is called the adductor tubercle, and that's where the muscle adductor magnus attaches. And so finally for this part, let's just go through the distal femoral features. So firstly, you have two condyles, and condyle just means knuckle, and you have a lateral one and a medial one, and they're covered in hyaline cartilage and sit on the top of your tibia to form the tibiofemoral joint. And then slightly above these are two smaller knuckles, which are called the medial and lateral epicondyles. And so, also on the anterior aspect of the knee, we also have a groove which the patella runs in, which is called the trochlear groove. However, it's been assigned various names, including the trochlear notch, patella groove, and the femoral sulcus, but just remember they, they all mean the same thing, however primarily it's mostly referred to now as the trochlear groove. And finally, if you look on the posterior view on the right, um, the, there is an intercondylar fossa, which is a depression between the two femoral condyles, and that provides the attachment points for the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. And the final things I just want to touch on for completeness are two angles that the femur naturally has, the angle of inclination and the torsion angle of the femur. So the first thing is the femoral angle of inclination. So all this is, is the angle that's formed between the intersection of a line that you, an imaginary line that's going down the shaft of the femur and a line that's going through the neck of the femur. And so typically in the normal adult, we have an angle of inclination of between 120 and 135 degrees. Uh, but please bear in mind that as with all the angles that I'll say, that different texts will state just slightly different figures. But the average healthy adult has an angle of inclination reported to be around 130 degrees. But if this angle increases more than 135 degrees, then it's referred to as coxa valga. And if this angle decreases less than 120 degrees, then it's referred to as coxa vera. And finally is the femoral angle of torsion. So it depends what book you're reading because it's got a couple of different names, um, including the femoral angle of torsion, femoral neck antiversion, and also the angle of declination. So I've put three different images on the screen because it can be a bit confusing to describe and I think it will help hopefully with some of the conceptualization when I'm describing it. So basically the angle of torsion is formed by looking at the relationship between the axis of the femoral head and neck and the femoral condyles. So if you just take a look at the top right picture, um, you have to imagine as though the femur is lying flat on a table and you take a line on the base of the table. So imagine the where the table is, that's a line that's running on the base. And then you take another line that runs through the head and neck of femur. And where those two lines intersect, you'll get an angle. Um, so the middle picture is looking down, so top down on the femur. And that's, it's just 
it's just easier to see what we're referring to. Um, so the normal femur has an angle of torsion of between 10 and 15 degrees antiversion. So antiversion just means leaning forwards. And in this context, it means the femoral neck is leaning forwards in the normal person between 10 and 15 degrees. If this angle increases, so i.e. 20, 25, 30 degrees, that's obviously an increase in femoral antiversion. And if the angle decreases, then that's referred to as retroversion. And really, it's only really important to note that these angles are completely normal aspects of the femur, um, but if they become grossly abnormal, they can affect joint stability. Um, and an example of this is femoral antiversion, which has an occurrence of stated up to about 10% in children. So it's worth noting, when, when you're born, you have a degree of antiversion. So your, your neck of femur lies forward by 40 degrees in respect to your femoral condyles. And, and as you get to adulthood, that actually reduces down to between that normal 10 and 15 degree rate. If you have a very large angle of antiversion, though, that can be responsible for an in toeing gait pattern in children, which is just where children are walking with their toes inwards. So that's everything that I wanted to cover on the femur. And so I hope you found this tutorial useful. And if you have them, please like this video, subscribe to our channel and check out some of our other videos. And thank you for watching.